yes, it's wonderful to have this. I want to thank CEDA and I want to thank DGIS and Energia for such a wonderful opportunity. Um, yes, I, uh, this, this picture, I loved it, but the next time I talk about this, I want somebody with, uh, with uh, from another, uh, who's not white. Let's put it bluntly. Yeah. I, we need uh, more women all over the world in this business. Okay, it's a little bit different, this, this uh, area, but very important. And I, uh, it needs to be part of our energy work. And I'm here to tell, I, I'm not a petroleum uh, expert by any means. I'm a sociologist, but I've done work in this sector. So I just want to give you a little bit of information to show you that it's only a question of understanding a bit and then applying what we know to this sector as well. Oh, I should uh, change the slide. This is what I'm going to talk about, give you a bit of background, tell you about Norway's Oil for Development program, gender issues in the oil and gas industry, and then making some connections at the end. Uh, okay, the background, petroleum. Uh, I want to make the relationship between petroleum and oil and gas. Petroleum is a complex liquid mixture of hydrocarbons, which are organic uh, compounds consisting of hydrogen and carbon. Technically, petroleum refers only to crude oil, but it's commonly used to include all liquid, gaseous, and solid hydrocarbons. So oil and gas have very different requirements in their production and treatment, and people in the industry are generally very clear about which substance they're dealing with, oil or natural gas. So we can talk about petroleum in general, but uh, it's important to distinguish whether we're talking about oil or natural gas. I'm going to start with petroleum and move into the specifics. Petroleum industry is divided into three different sectors. The upstream industry, where they search for, recover, and produce crude oil and natural gas. Midstream is the processing, storing, marketing, and transporting of the oil or natural gas. And downstream is the refining and processing of crude oil, natural gas, and sale and distribution of thousands of products. This is not a strict division, as we are finding out. Uh, different um, uh, people adjust what they're doing into different areas for their own purposes. But basically, uh, upstream is the production, uh, exploration production, midstream processing, transportation, and midstream is also usually included in downstream. So we can just talk about upstream, downstream. Oh, I hope that didn't sound more complicated than it is, <coughs> but we'll keep going. Uh, so petroleum products, I just want to remind you, are huge. We've got, uh, of course, gasoline, diesel, natural gas, propane, kerosene, LPG, but we also have asphalt, lubricants, <coughs> plastics, fertilizers, pesticides, pharmaceuticals. So these are just the basics of our modern life. We need these things. We must um, uh, um, bring them into our talk on energy. Um, uh, I wanted to say one thing. Nothing on the products here, sorry. Uh, paraffin. What was paraffin? <laughs> I didn't know. Uh, it turns out, just to clear the question up, that paraffin is the English word for kerosene. Paraffin is also a wax, but there's a, an oil form that's used for lighting in a lot of countries in the world, and that's the same as kerosene. So just so you know, they're the same thing. Uh, upstream industry. So here I'm going to tell you, because exploration is the search for the right kind of rock formations with the right deposits. They, it involves geophysical prospecting, blasting, and or exploratory drilling. And this can be, of course, onshore or offshore, so in the ocean or on land, usually in remote locations on land. Well development, that's drilling and construction of the wells, and then production, extracting the hydrocarbons, separating them out, and taking out unwanted components, and then site abandonment, plugging it up, and restoring the site and hopefully leaving it uh, in good shape. 
Uh, yeah, it was, okay. Okay, mid and downstream uh, include the transportation, the pipelines, the refineries, processing plants, natural gas distribution, which involves all that piping around cities. You know, if, if, if you want gas in your house, you need these underlying pipes. So that's a huge expense. That is very expensive compared to LPG use. But of course, very um, useful. I'm a great proponent of gas for cooking, so I'm happy to have natural gas in my own kitchen from a pipeline. Then retail outlets, petrol stations. Uh, and uh, and also filling for propane and all that. Okay, so the message of this slide is basically that upstream and downstream are very different. There are different activities and skills associated. In upstream, we have a lot of geoscience, the geologists and geophysicists, uh, different kinds of engineers than downstream, both chemical, civil, but upstream we have drilling rig, rig operators and field workers. Downstream we have a lot of business operations. And similarly, oversight and regulation is done by very separate uh, entities. So upstream we have the Ministry of Petroleum or Natural Resources or Environmental Protection. There can be independent commissions. Uh, but that is completely separate from downstream where we have we have um, regulation of commerce rather than resources. So we have the ministries of energy, commerce, and industry involved more at the down, on the downstream level. And you get a lot more you know, that's private sector in both, but different types. OK. So um, now let's uh, just speak quickly about uh, Norway's Oil for Development program, because Kari is going to talk about it tomorrow. She, um, she's a representative from NORAD, um, but I'm just going to give uh, you an idea of the <coughs> program that Energia has been supporting. Uh, we've started, it was, we started last year, uh, about September last year, and uh, we began with Mozambique. So I've been involved in that program, and we're, we're learning a lot. Uh, hopefully we're getting somewhere. Uh, Oil for Development is Nor Norway's program to assist developing countries to manage their petroleum resources sustainably. They work at the institutional level, building the capacities of public authorities responsible for petroleum resources. They focus on three themes, resource management, revenue management, environmental management. Okay, so we have OFD support at the upstream level not downstream. Uh, ENP is exploration and production, that's a common term, and pipelines. They've included pipelines in the upstream industry. Uh, and their, their uh, support, your resource revenue and environmental management, translates into excellent help with regulatory frameworks, legislation, technical expertise, uh, they have really excellent training programs for people from around the world. And the goal is to help um, the governments of um, developing nations take it over for themselves. Apparently, when NORAD started, only in the 80s, it was the Americans. Usten told me this. The Americans were the ones who uh, helped Norway learn about it. And they insisted that capacity development was part of all the assistance that the Americans were bringing. And I mean, it had a huge effect. Now they're leaders in the world. They're really admirable in what they do. But the point I want also want to make here is that under OFD, you can only do upstream activities, not downstream. So guess what? No LPG, no energy for cooking. Uh, because that's use, right? It's products in use at the downstream level. So OFD doesn't cover it. But I'd just like to say we're bringing, uh, we're identifying this issue, bringing it to people's attention. That's the beginning of making change. So hopefully uh, we'll be able to find a way to do more on that in the future. Oh, yeah, I just wanted to say OFD is supporting government agencies in 23 countries. These are their eight core countries. Uh, and as well, this is wonderful, they support civil society organizations to help keep the government accountable for how it uses the revenues 
what it does in, in terms of regulation of the industry, but also how it uses the revenues. Uh, this is really, really important. I'll say more in a minute. Okay, so uh, that's OFD support, and now I'm going to look um, at the gender issues in the oil and gas industry. I have five here I'm going to talk about. First, local impacts of upstream petroleum development activities. What happens uh, in, in, uh, as, these, as the uh, petroleum is produced? Explore, exploration and development, uh, pr production. At the downstream level, we have access and use of products. Uh, then we have, or what happens to the government revenues, also called take, the government take. Uh, environmental impacts at the bigger level and employment equity. Those are the five. Let's start with local impacts. Basically, it's uh, differential impacts on women and men of employment and economic opportunities, population displacements and resettlement, disruptions in natural ecosystems and livelihoods depending on them, and the community disruptions and conflicts that result for, oh. Do you see it there? Oh. Yeah, bit. Oh, anyway, it's uh, the influx of large numbers of men for jobs makes a big difference. You know about this. It's called boom time effects. When a whole lot of men come into a small community, all kinds of things happen, and a lot of it is detrimental for women. So I don't know. Yeah, you don't have the social vices. I love that. Term. Here, um, well, there's a uh, you know, uh, influx of large numbers of men for jobs results in many social vices, which of course is gambling, drinking, prostitution. I um, mean, it's a nice way to sum it up. There are also many good things that happen. There's an influx, uh, there's also um, income, jobs, but often women don't to share equally in those, as you know. Okay. Then local impacts of accidents. This is uh, a very difficult. Nigeria's had terrible problems with this. Terrible, yes, you mentioned it this morning, Sarah. It's just so uh, abominable, and we have to find ways to avoid it. I, in working in Mozambique, uh, Nord has helped with, um, uh, with Norway because um, the legislation and the monitoring system, well, not the mon legislation and regulations to make sure it's done properly. So that, that's in place. But what worries me is monitoring, uh, and they're only starting in Mozambique. But um, let's hope it goes well. And there is a, uh, this civil society uh, platform that will be watching and uh, Nor is also helping them build their skills so they know what to watch for and how to um, monitor and report and call the government to order. I'll, I'll leave the rest of that. There's a very, that, uh, uh, Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative is a very useful mechanism, but I may not have time for that. Okay, so we got, here's the uh, accidents, okay. Um, same problems, mostly relating to ecosystem damage. Um, when uh, the uh, resources are damaged that people rely on, then of course there's terrible problems in health impacts, economic impacts, nutritional impacts. That's, an, that's sufficient. It's wonderful to be talking to people who know so much and then I don't have to say, get into the details. Okay, gender, uh, gender bias in benefits and costs. Of course, as you know, major benefits of employment and compensation mostly go to men. Costs of community disruptions and environmental degradation fall most heavily on women uh, because of their family and household responsibilities. Uh, of course, there are many, many possibilities for mitigating these risks and costs and increasing the benefits, and those have to be strengthened. Uh, right, move this. There are major efforts to provide benefits to local communities, both by oil companies and by government, uh, through social support and compensation funding. So oil and gas companies, now have this important uh, corporate social responsibility uh, policies. They have really quite strong policies now. They want to make sure that the communities benefit in order that uh, you know, there's, there's, there's not trouble down the line and that they are bringing the community in. I mean, 
uh, they definitely, okay, anyway, the policies are good, but they need to make sure that the uh, projects get where they need to go and that women are included. Their government projects are uh, funded through taxes on oil companies, and these can be directed towards projects benefiting women, like water, health, education. Uh, there have even been some efforts to provide jobs for women, but generally there's no conscious effort to deal with the gender differences, and that's where we need to do capacity building. Access and use of products. See the, the woman on the left? We, I mean, there's such a huge, okay, let me get in. <laughs> it's a, okay. Uh, this is the downstream side, so it's out of Oil for De Development's mandate, but as we've been uh, talking here, there's so much to be done. Uh, the 2.7 billion people that uh, IEA talks about, as we know, are mostly women, relying on biomass and inefficient stoves for cooking. LPG, or bottled gas, is, is, has been uh, identified as I, by IEA as a major energy source for switching from biomass to cooking. But the fact is that um, it, it's mostly, it's mostly uh, in urban areas, uh, because of price and distribution issues, it's not available for everybody. It won't solve the whole problem is what I want to say. But it's a major... Um, uh, tool and source that needs to be uh, expanded, uh, especially in Africa. In India, we, everybody uses it, uh, Bangladesh, so Asia more. But Africa, it, it could help a lot. Um, but it's uh, outside OFD's uh, support. And the other thing is that it's seldom a mandate for government, I mean a priority for government. When they think energy, they think of other things. Energy for cooking isn't so big, but you know, it would have a huge impact on um, the deforestation problem if, if uh, cities could switch to LPG use. Okay, that's uh, the, this minute. oh yeah, that we're under access here. And the other part of it is access to other petroleum products. I can't find any particular gender issue in those. So it's the same as usual, women's lack of information income and control over resources would be the uh, constraint to their use, their equal use of those products. Government take is the taxes, royalties, production sharing agreements, or direct ownership in uh, petroleum production. So these are what uh, the government collects. The Norwegian Pension Fund, if you haven't heard about it, it it's a uh, fabulous uh, uh, mechanism. Norway leads the world in financial management of their petroleum resources, their petroleum revenue, sorry. They're a model for all of us. They invest the current resources er, that they get every year in a pension fund. They just call it a pension fund. It's a fund for use of the country over time so that the uh, future generations can benefit from the resources that uh, they're earning now, the revenues earned now. It's a, a wonderful model, but difficult for uh, many... I'm from Canada, so I wish we were as good as this. And, uh, in fact, at this moment, could I please apologize for our stand at Derwin? Our withdrawal from Canada. We're ashamed, and there's a lot of citizens who did not uh, vote for the government doing this. Uh, you may have heard of tar sands, same problem. That's why I feel bad, but anyway. Uh, okay, so that's in Norway. Norway is just such a model. Uh, so here, we, okay, we got the we got the government take the revenue. So the question is, are there any gender differences in the benefits and risks of the use of the revenues? So wh how the revenues are used? The revenues just go into the government coffers. Very hard to find out what they're used for. But if wh whatever they're used for, are there any gender differences in that? It would be good to know, and then we could maybe compensate or do something else. But it's very hard to find out oh, how they're used. So um, uh, in for OFD, it might be possible where they are advising the, the uh, accounting departments or in terms of how to manage your revenues. Um, it might be possible to ask, you know, how are these revenues used? Am I almost... Uh, I'm, 
Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I thought. Okay. So the next, uh, I'll, I'll finish with that. Uh, environmental impacts. We just get so. Anyway, this um, we talked about the local environmental impacts. This is. Uh, impacts at the general level, climate change, and Monique uh, is going to speak about that after. I just, I just want to make the connection. Oil and gas production and use results in uh, a lot of gas emissions and climate change, and, uh, but she'll speak about how women are affected. <laughs> I couldn't resist this picture. It's just, this is on employment equity and women's presence. We've been speaking about it before in Kenya. Um, uh, women work on oil rigs too. This is from Chennai, India, uh, and you'll see that half these workers are women. A wonderful sign. Uh, so women are increasing the presence in the oil and gas industry. They're making up about 21% of workforce. I found this out in UK and Norway. It's very hard to get figures, but there are increasing efforts to attract and retain women. You can find or, um, organizations for women's, uh, women in petroleum on the internet. Good sign. The barriers are mainly the field work in remote areas, difficult accommodation, difficult working conditions, uh, but necessary to um, uh, promotion in the field. You really, if you're in oil and gas, it's professional, you need to be out there. And of course, attitudes are always a problem. It's not seen as suitable both by colleagues and by families. Okay, those, I, that, I'm just summarizing those issues that we just uh, talked about. Uh, and uh, I want to let you know that there's more and more information and experience. The World Bank has done work on gender mainstreaming in the extractive industries, which includes petroleum but focuses on mining. Uh, Norway and the World Bank have a petroleum governance initiative that includes a study on gender dimensions. Hopefully that's coming out soon. Uh, uh, a report uh, on the, a pipeline in West Africa. The, the, just ask me, I can give you the references if you want them, and then oil for development's experience in Mozambique, Timor-Leste, and now Uganda we're starting on. Uh oh Okay, well that's a sign. There are... Oh, okay, okay. okay. I, just, I just wanted to conclude, and I'll try to do it quickly. This builds on what Taneki was saying this morning about connections. My major frustration with energy is it's all so cut up. It's all separated. You know, it's a segmented industry. Uh, so on this side, the energy sources, we've got so many uh, different subsectors, and even in oil and gas, it's separated upstream, downstream, electric power, it's hydro, it's thermal, it's rural, it, and then biomass, but and none of these are related to each other. A real problem. Now, let's see what I get here. Yes. I did, uh, anyway, never mind. Uh, okay, but on the, on the youth side, it's very connected. I mean, um, uh, energy use is uh, for so many different purposes. No one source can meet all needs. So there's different sources and technologies that suit different purposes. It's not all about cooking. Uh, we all need different kinds of energy. So, so we, we know, and, and in a lot of countries, uh, people even have to keep backup systems for even one purpose, for cooking. You can have a cylinder, but you better have some kerosene in case it runs out. So we know about these interconnections. Um, but not all the policymakers. Oh, sorry, I want to go back if I can, yes. So the constraints in the middle are the focus of the work we do. Uh, we look at the gender differences in availability and access, information, pricing and credit, appropriate technologies. Good, but I really, well, I think we're all realizing here that, uh, or we've realized it for many years, that we need to make the connections to bring it all together. So uh, all I'm saying is we need comprehensive treatment of all the needs and sources so that we can make more effective um, uh, policies and solutions. Uh, we need to connect the policies and programs for all the subsectors so you can, you know, you bring, bring in the cooking stoves into the uh, Department of Energy's work and, uh, rather than just leave them to the Department of Agriculture. It just doesn't make sense. Uh, then uh, ensuring that social and gender dimensions are central to all policies and solutions for more effective development. That's what we hear. Okay, very easy for me to say this. How to do this is what we're discussing. Uh, so that's it. Thank you very much.